So the other big issue, of course, the big news is uh, this week, Katie Magbanua uh, has left the Department of Corrections where she now resides uh, and is in Tallahassee for this proffer offer. She is the convicted middle woman in the case. She received a sentence of life in prison without parole after refusing to cooperate with the government. She was convicted. This is all just for background. I know most of you guys know this. She was convicted at the end of May. And now, six months later, she's finally ready to meet with prosecutors in a proffer deal. She insisted during not just one trial, but two trials, the first which ended in a hung jury, that she was innocent. Uh, this despite a seeming preponderance of evidence against her. Now she is ready to make a deal uh, and about face here. Mark, what do you make of this? This is big news. Well, I first I'd want to know, and I'm not in the weeds, so you guys can educate me. Did she testify in either or both of her trials? Jeremy, I'm going to let you uh, pick all that up. She testified in both. So she is definitely locked into a uh, version of events. And what was um, lit on the first trial? The first trial was a hung jury, and she denied any any involvement in this crime. And what was the um, what was the guilt not guilt split of the hung? I think there was one holdout for acquittal on the first one, and okay. that interview that juror has actually gave given some interesting interviews about her her time as a juror, um, and the second one, of course. Um, guilty and she testified again. And so there's two transcripts out there. That makes it uh, exceedingly difficult. I, I know they do it in federal a lot more often than they do in state, but it makes it exceedingly difficult for the prosecution to now say, okay, you, because you know what the, what the defense lawyer is going to say, oh, you testified once, thought you could, uh, the, the, you hung the jury, you testified again to another jury. So there were presumably scores of people who are listening to you and whose time you're telling them under oath. Now, after you've been sentenced to life, you're going to change your story and, and say that you did have something to do with it and you're going to incriminate somebody else. That's a, that's a very tough thing to do. And so to that point, Mark, I mean, what goes into, I mean, you're on the on the flip side, uh, on the defense side, but what goes into a prosecutor's calculus when they're agreeing to meet uh, with a defendant in this sort of situation? If there's something that she can give them that they don't have or a link that or corroboration of some form, not that you just don't have to listen to her, but she gives you some information that can then independently be corroborated, then that's something that would be attractive to a prosecutor. When I first started practicing, especially in the federal system, Rule 35, either side could post-conviction come and cooperate. That was later um, amended to make it just the prosecutor could come in and initiate what's called the Rule 35. Not, testifying not once, but twice in a trial and get sentenced to life. You'd be hard pressed to be able to argue with a straight face to a juror if you're a prosecutor that obviously she doesn't have a motivation to fabricate or implicate somebody. And what, what's, I mean, particularly interesting too is she's tied uh, to the man who was uh, already convicted of murder. She's his uh, baby mama, as they say, the hitman uh, accused of actually pulling the trigger in this case. And she's also tied to Charlie Adelson, who's about to go on trial as her former, as uh, his former girlfriend. You know, there's a picture out there. I know you said you're not in the weeds on this of Wendy Adelson, the ex-wife of Dan Markell. It's a picture of uh, Wendy and Katie Magbanua, you know, on the beach in their bikinis hanging out. And so there's a lot of speculation in the Dan Markell world that Katie does know quite a bit and uh, either figuratively or literally has uh, the receipts. And, and last time I spoke to Jeremy, Jeremy said, look, there's an underwritten rule among uh, the state and defense attorneys that if you're going to make a proffer, you better bring something to the table. Uh, do you agree with that, Mark? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't surprise me if... Uh, the defense lawyer has already done what we used to what we used to call an attorney proffer, where they reached out to the prosecutor, said, look, you may want to talk to her because I think do it in broad stroke terms. But you say, I think that uh, she's ready to talk and she can say A, B, C, D or E. How many times are you probably you guys have probably had the same experience where people will say, 
geez, aren't you worried doing criminal defense or aren't you worried when you go to the criminal courthouse? And I said, no, that's the safest place. The place I get worried is going over to the family law courthouse. That's where that's, that's where right. fired or where people get <laughs> crazy. And so there is a, a natural inclination by people who have been through the system to suspect there's a family law style connection for somebody to get fired up during a divorce. I mean, it happens all the time. I know that there's there's been at least here in Los Angeles, five different shootings that I can think of and, and murders resulting from family and including a family law judge. So you know, emotions run hot and that's where people get the craziest.